In this video, I'll review the main ways that respiratory gases are transported in our blood, and then I'll talk briefly about how carbon monoxide poisoning can disrupt the transportation of oxygen within our blood. It is really important for oxygen and carbon dioxide to be transported in our blood to get from one area to another. For example, oxygen must move from our lungs into our blood, so it's going to move into our pulmonary capillaries. That oxygen will then travel in our blood to the left side of our heart, where it will then be pumped out of our heart to all the tissue cells in our body. So that oxygenated blood will travel to the upper parts of our body to supply those tissue cells, as well as the lower parts of our body to supply those tissue cells. Our tissue cells are always making carbon dioxide and producing carbon dioxide, which is a waste product. Remember, oxygen is used in a process known as cellular respiration, where oxygen and glucose are taken in by our tissue cells, and oxygen and glucose are converted into carbon dioxide and water. When glucose is broken down, as the bonds are being broken in that chemical, it releases energy, and that energy is used to make ATP, which is the usable form of chemical energy in our cells. For each glucose molecule that's broken down, we get about 38 ATP molecules made. So again, in order to make this usable form of energy within our cells, our cells are constantly making carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out of those tissue cells into our blood. And then that carbon dioxide must travel through our blood to the right side of the heart. Our right side of our heart will then pump that blood to our lungs. That carbon dioxide will then leave our blood, enter our lungs, where we will then exhale and breathe out that waste. So now let's look at the main mechanisms our body uses to transport oxygen in our blood. Most of the oxygen, so about 98.5% of the oxygen in our blood is transported in the blood bound to a protein known as hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, sometimes it can be abbreviated as HGB or just HB, is a protein in our red blood cells that binds to and transports oxygen. Oxygen is not very soluble in our blood, so it's very hard for our blood to carry oxygen unless it is bound to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin allows our blood to carry large amounts of oxygen that would not be possible if these molecules did not exist. Just to put this into perspective, there's about 270 million hemoglobin molecules in each red blood cell. So red blood cells are pretty much just jam-packed with hemoglobin, and that is pretty much their primary job is to transport oxygen. Each hemoglobin molecule carries a maximum of four oxygen molecules. So you can see that here. So this is one hemoglobin molecule, and it contains four oxygen molecules. So there's a binding site for four oxygen molecules here. Hemoglobin can exist either as oxyhemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin, that word means oxygenated hemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin pretty much just means hemoglobin without oxygen or deoxygenated hemoglobin. So oxyhemoglobin would be hemoglobin with one to four oxygen molecules attached, as you can see here. Now, it's going to be very rare to see a hemoglobin molecule with just one oxygen molecule attached. Usually, they either have zero or four oxygen molecules attached. The reason for that is the binding of one oxygen molecule to a hemoglobin molecule changes the hemoglobin molecule in a way that it increases the attraction or affinity for other oxygen molecules to attach. So if one oxygen molecule attaches, it's likely that three others will rapidly attach afterwards. Deoxyhemoglobin, on the other hand, is hemoglobin with no oxygen molecules attached. So your venous blood that is returning to the heart from your tissue cells is going to contain a lot more deoxyhemoglobin because of the fact that that blood is deoxygenated. Whereas blood that's very oxygenated, such as the blood that's returning to your heart from the lungs, it's going to have a lot of oxyhemoglobin in it. So as I stated about 98.5% of the oxygen in your blood is transported bound to hemoglobin. So what about the remaining 1.5%? Well, the remaining 1.5% of oxygen is going to be transported, dissolved in the blood plasma. Now, that's only a small amount of the total amount of oxygen 
in your blood because oxygen is not very soluble in your blood plasma. So it's really hard for it to dissolve and be transported that way. Now let's look at the mechanisms that our body uses to transport carbon dioxide. Most carbon dioxide that enters the blood, so about 90% of it, is converted to bicarbonate ions. The molecular formula for that, it's HCO3, and it's a negative ion. So let's look at how those bicarbonate ions are formed. So carbon dioxide is very reactive with water, and your blood is mostly water. So carbon dioxide will quickly react with the water in your blood, and it will become something known as carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates, or in other words, falls apart really quickly. So carbonic acid, when it's formed, will quickly dissociate into bicarbonate and release hydrogen ions. This is one of the reasons why the more carbon dioxide in your blood, the more acidic your blood becomes. That's because your blood will contain a lot more hydrogen ions as the carbon dioxide levels increase. Now, red blood cells are really important also in the conversion of carbon dioxide into bicarbonate ions because red blood cells contain an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that speeds up this chemical reaction here. So it speeds up the formation of bicarbonate from carbon dioxide and water. So when carbon dioxide enters your blood, a lot of it will enter your red blood cells where it will come in contact with carbonic anhydrase, this enzyme, and that will quickly convert carbon dioxide and water into this bicarbonate. Now some carbon dioxide, about 5% of the carbon dioxide in your arteries will bind to hemoglobin in the red blood cells. Now, it's important to note though that hemoglobin has a stronger affinity, in other words, attraction for oxygen than carbon dioxide. So if oxygen is available, hemoglobin will preferably bind to oxygen. In your veins, that means up to about 30% of carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin because again, you're many of your veins do not contain a lot of oxygen. So carbon dioxide does not really have to compete a lot with oxygen to bind to hemoglobin within many of your veins. Now the remaining amount of carbon dioxide, which is about 5% here, is just gonna be dissolved in the blood plasma. Remember carbon dioxide is more soluble in blood than oxygen. So you're gonna see more carbon dioxide dissolved in the blood plasma than you will see oxygen. So this is an interesting image that I found in a paper that shows the distribution of carbon dioxide and how it's carried in arteries versus uh, veins. So remember, most arteries are going to be more oxygenated than veins. So arteries tend to carry oxygenated blood for the most part, um, and veins tend to carry deoxygenated blood for the most part. And so if we're looking here, we can see that in the arteries where you have more oxygenated blood, less of that carbon dioxide in that blood is going to be bound to the hemoglobin, which we call that carb aminos, um, whenever you see carbon dioxide attached to hemoglobin. So about 5% of it is attached to hemoglobin, 90% of it is converted to bicarbonate, and then 5% of it is just dissolved in the blood. Now, if we look at our veins, which are relatively uh, deoxygenated compared to the arteries, there's gonna be more carbon dioxide bound to the hemoglobin, about 30% of it. And that's again, because there's less oxygen in that blood, so carbon dioxide does not have to compete with oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. And then, so then we have less that's converted to bicarbonate in the veins, and then um, a little bit more is actually dissolved in the blood. But the main point here is that most carbon dioxide, whether you're talking about the veins or the arteries, is converted to bicarbonate, and that's how it's transported in our blood. And then next, we have some bound to hemoglobin. The amount bound to hemoglobin is mostly affected by how much oxygen is present in those uh, vessels. And then finally, what's left over of carbon dioxide is going to be dissolved in the blood plasma. Now let's talk a little bit about carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless toxic gas. It's found in smoke, it's found in engine exhaust, and it's produced by furnaces and stoves that burn fuel, such as natural gas, propane, or oil. So stoves that are electric will not be giving off carbon monoxide. Now, one important fact 
that's important to know about carbon monoxide is that hemoglobin has a stronger affinity or attraction for carbon monoxide than oxygen. And it binds 210 to 220 times stronger to hemoglobin than oxygen does. So remember what we just talked about is that if hemoglobin has a choice to choose between oxygen and carbon dioxide, it's going to bind to oxygen. However, if hemoglobin has the choice to choose between carbon monoxide gas and oxygen, it's going to choose carbon monoxide and it's going to bind very strongly to that carbon monoxide to the point where oxygen cannot bind to the hemoglobin. Okay, so here we can see that hemoglobin molecule, there's oxygen bound to it. If we introduce carbon monoxide to the blood, that carbon monoxide will outcompete with the oxygen and kick the oxygen out so that carbon monoxide will be bound to the hemoglobin. Now oxygen cannot be transported in our blood because oxygen cannot be transported in our blood unless it's bound to hemoglobin. So this is what leads to carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning affects about 40,000 people every single year in the United States. It occurs when a person inhales too much carbon monoxide in the air. Carbon monoxide then diffuses into the blood and replaces oxygen in our red blood cells. Oxygen cannot then be transported in our blood so our cells become deprived of oxygen and that leads to cellular death. The symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning include dizziness, headache, nausea, confusion, loss of consciousness, and then death. So it is really important to prevent carbon monoxide poisoning in your household. And so one of the best ways to prevent this is to use a carbon monoxide alarm because whenever carbon monoxide is leaking from something like your furnace or your stove, a lot of times people don't even notice it because it's colorless and it's odorless. A lot of deaths associated with carbon monoxide poisoning happen because people are sleeping in their house whenever carbon monoxide levels are getting high, maybe because of a leaking furnace or stove. And if you're asleep and you're exposed to carbon monoxide, well, you're going to lose consciousness and you're already unconscious when you're sleeping pretty much. And then that will lead to death because you won't even realize that you are breathing in this carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide alarms can detect whenever carbon monoxide levels are getting high in your house. They will leave, give off this really high pitch beeping sound that will alert you that you need to get out of your home. So let's look at how we can treat carbon monoxide poisoning. So if somebody is exposed to high levels of carbon monoxide, there's two things that you can do. One, administer a high dose of oxygen. So pretty much 100% oxygen, have them breathe that in. Normally, air is only about 21% oxygen. So you're really exposing them to a lot more oxygen than they would normally be breathing in from the air. On top of that, you want to place the person in an environment with a high atmospheric pressure because that's going to help drive oxygen into the body. And both of these types of treatment can be performed using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This is a procedure where the patient is placed in a chamber, as you can see in this image here, and the pressure in that chamber is about two to three times greater than the atmospheric pressure. You then administer pure oxygen, so then that person can pretty much just be breathing pure oxygen that's super pressurized into their lungs and that can force the oxygen into their blood. Okay, so here you can see the alveoli of the lungs here and you can see what normally it would look like at sea level, the atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760. The partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs then would be about 104 and your blood it's about 40. Okay, so oxygen diffuses down its partial pressure gradient into the blood. When you put somebody in a hyperbaric chamber, so let's say that they're, they've been breathing in carbon monoxide, so now they have a lot of carbon monoxide in their blood, which is shown by these little yellow and red molecules here. Okay, If they have a lot of carbon monoxide in their blood, the partial pressure of oxygen in their blood is going to be really low, so it's probably going to be less than 40 here. Then you put them in this pressurized chamber where the pressure is about three times that of the atmosphere, so take three times 760, that equals about 1,137 millimeters of mercury. And then you give them pretty much pure oxygen to breathe in. So the partial pressure of oxygen within their lungs is gonna be about 1,000, okay? Close to the um, pressure that they're breathing in. Because 
of this really large pressure gradient that you've now created, that's going to drive oxygen into their blood. And it's going to kick that carbon monoxide out of their blood. So now you're able to replace the carbon monoxide that was bound to their hemoglobin with oxygen.